Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another Weather Center Nazario segment. Thank you very much for joining me on this Tuesday afternoon, November 28th, 2023. Today, we are primarily going to be talking about the threat of severe weather for the southeast along the Gulf Coast line, particularly in the Dixie Alley region, as we have another frontal system and low pressure area expected to develop over the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles and push off to the east northeast. Before we get started, guys, you know the logistics of every video. Please like and share this video if you do enjoy the content I present to you guys and subscribe to the channel if you are brand new to the Weather Center and feel free to turn on your notifications so you don't miss an upcoming update. All right, we're starting off on Storm Prediction Center's homepage, a little bit of a difference from National Hurricane Center now that we are officially out of the tropical season, at least in the next two days. We're going to be starting off with Storm Prediction Center quite a bit over the next couple of weeks. You can see we now have a slight risk for some severe activity in the eastern Texas, the southwest periphery of Louisiana at this time. If I were to switch us over to our probabilistic view, you can also see SPC has increased the threat of severe possibility up to 15% now with about 7.3 million people under the gun for seeing some of this severe weather pan out as we go over the next 48 to 72 hours. I'll take you through some of the dynamics involved. It does not seem like this severe threat is going to be as expansive or as powerful as the one we observed about a week and a half to two weeks ago in that same general spot. However, don't rule out the possibility of seeing a stray funnel cloud or two, the likelihood of hail and especially strong convective winds as the system barrels through the south because we are going to be seeing some hellacious dynamics stacking all the way up to the the upper levels of the atmosphere down to the surface. So we're using our same water vapor satellite shot. However, we're looking a little bit closer to the lower 48, particularly the lower half of the United States, because if you look over Arizona, New Mexico, the desert southwest, you can see this area of enhanced moist air advection or moisture activity over those two aforementioned states. This is going to be our shortwave trough at 500 millibars that is expected to continue to propagate to the east and help to spur up quite a tremendous amount of activity for Texas, Oklahoma, spanning into Arkansas and Louisiana, and further on off to the east-northeast as this system follows along the subtropical jet you can see screaming across the Gulf of Mexico and the state of Florida. This is overall going to be our primary steering stimuli or the steering flow for much of our winter systems as we progress into December and through the month of December, January, and maybe even into February with El Nino kicking down doors going full force across much of the south. We'll switch on over to Pivotal Weather and we'll use our GFS 500 millibar vorticity chart. And if you look down over the desert southwest, particularly Arizona, New Mexico, maybe folding back into parts of Southern California and Baja California, right in through there to kind of interpret what it is we identified on the water vapor, there's our shortwave trough still in, I guess you could call it the preliminary stages of really intensifying our upper air pattern. You can see in our black lines the contour gradient pattern, just a little bit of a weak indication that we have some kind of a mid level, upper level trough propagating through that general region or that quadrant of the United States. And if I clear the ink and continue to transition this through time over the next 48 to 72 hours, you can track that through the southern tier. There you have it. You can start to see a little bit more of that vorticity amplify coming in alongside that cutoff entity we highlighted in our live stream yesterday evening. And as we go through Thursday and especially Friday, take a look across the deep south and the southeast, particularly Dixie Alley, as I mentioned at the start of this video, just how much that vorticity ran up our pattern across Texas, the Texarkana area, predominantly the Gulf Coast states altogether spanning into the rest of the southeast. As this continues through, you can really see how aggressive and negatively tilted that trough becomes as it kicks through. This is going to help to develop our surface level feature and help to really intensify just how much thunderstorm and rain coverage we see down at ground level. So really, we're looking in the upper levels first and helping to locate where our negatively tilted trough is. And the main reason this is important is this is where we are likely to see a lot of our most intense thunderstorm coverage begin to develop because of the orientation of that trough in the upper levels and the jet supporting it up at 300 millibars. So now that we know what's happening in the upper levels, let's go downstairs and see what's happening closer to the ground. Here's our 12Z European model, and if you look off the coast of central and northern California, right about the Sacramento Bay area, if you will, there we do have our upper level low, our cutoff low entity beginning to work its way in and bring up your rain chances if you live out there in the Bay area of central and northern 
Southern California. And as you track that through time, if you watch, it might be a little difficult to translate across the Southern Rockies. Typically, low-level features as they move over higher terrain features like mountains, hills, anything that goes above the surface to 925 millibar level will usually lose it in our surface charts. But you can see that increased snowfall and rainfall probability for Arizona, New Mexico as it translates itself across. And at the 72-hour mark, there you go. I know I kind of jumped ahead in time, but there's our system expected to ramp up all of our rainfall and thunderstorm coverage and provide us with that threat for severe, especially into eastern Texas, Louisiana, maybe even affecting parts of Arkansas and Mississippi despite it not really being highlighted on Storm Prediction Center. I'll take it back to the 48-hour mark so we can see all that return flow around our mid-Atlantic high pressure, driving a lot of that moisture and that maritime tropical air out of the south to the north across much of the Gulf Coast states. And then we have our feature embedded across the southern Rockies, continuing to move off to the east. And as that system interacts with that area of temperature and dew point discontinuity, as we go to 54, 60, 66 hours, you can see rapid cyclogenesis begin to take place. Our low pressure is now easily identifiable down at the surface level. And with that interaction comes widespread rainfall. We could also see some localized flooding with this event as our QPFs are upwards of six to eight inches in some spots. Now I'm going to take you in real close so we can identify some of these low-level parameters. Since we started at the jet in the 500 millibar level, let's go downstairs, as I mentioned previously, so we can examine what the low-level environment looks like and exactly what we're dealing with. We're looking at our GFS 12 Zulu. On the left-hand side, we have our 850 millibar winds. And on the right-hand side, we actually have our dew point temperature because this is going to help to highlight exactly where the delineation between air masses is likely to take place. So if you look at the left-hand side first, notice how we get a sudden acceleration in the winds at 850 millibars. Because it's a southerly oriented flow, if you look at our dew points now, you can see those tropical dew point temperatures starting to come up into Texas, the Louisiana Gulf Coast, and try to span even further to the north into Oklahoma. This is what's going to help to create our line of instability is what we'll call it. If you continue to move through time, as that system begins to evacuate out of the Rockies, out of the desert southwest, notice how we get a very, very sharp contrast in our dew point temps at the surface. We have 65 degrees as our maximum, maybe even up to 67 along the coastline of Texas, out ahead of that system as it moves across the south and central plains. And then we have very, very dry dew point temperatures, almost like a dry line we typically see during the summertime, although this is going to be a jet-supported frontal system. So as this area of strong winds continues to intensify the amount of not only surface but mid-level buoyancy we see out ahead of this frontal system in that baroclinic low forming over the central plains, once that front and that area of cold air and dry dew point temps can come out of the Rockies and move into that lower terrain of eastern Texas and most of the Gulf Coast for that matter, that's when we're going to see ignition right along this line of greatest discontinuity. Like I said, if you look at a summertime chart, this looks very representative or indicative of what we would see as a dry line setup. And and with the dry line as well during the summertime is where we get our very, very aggressive supercells, very large, almost wedge-like tornadoes. Not saying that's the case here, but we have very similar dynamics and a very, very mirror image of the environment at play, just with a bit of different dynamics in the upper levels. Last but not least, our FV3 high-res mesoscale model is only going to be able to take us that far out in time to get a close look at exactly what we're dealing with. On the left-hand side, we have our simulated reflectivity. On the right-hand side, we have our supercell parameters, just so we can get an idea of just how much rotation or how much supercell action we could see down in that area. And as we get past the 36 hour mark, you can see a lot of that precip action really begin to form up as that air mass interaction I mentioned on the previous slide begins to take shape. And notice how as that frontal system comes across and interacts not only with our low level jet, but that stark contrast in our temp and dew point temperatures in the low levels, on top of that low level jet bringing in those moist dew points, our relative humidity is also going to go up simultaneously. Simultaneously. So again, we have very, very conflicted air masses, very different types of air, if you will, kind of button up against one another. And that's exactly why we're going to have such an intense situation unfolding. And if I take us to the very tail end of the loop, you can see widespread intense thunderstorm coverage spanning Oklahoma, getting into the Arkansas area, as well as Louisiana, Mississippi, beginning to exit at this point out of eastern Texas. But look at how those supercell parameters are also going up as well. So once again, folks, just to reemphasize, we're not looking at a 
severe event that's going to be as much of a heavy hitter as we observed about a week or so ago. We are going to see the same kind of threats. We just might not have as much tornadic activity because we have a bit of a lesser amount of buoyancy in the low levels or our cape, as I've mentioned in previous weather center segments available to this system. Because we had a cold front come through, we're only going to give the environment on the leading edge of this system ample time to modify. It's not going to have too much time to really modify out and give us that warm, moist air that we would typically see out ahead of a supercell kind of setup. Could we see an isolated tornado or two? Absolutely. We're not ruling that possibility out. Is the chance for hail there? Yes, very small and marginal at best. Could convective winds really begin to take shape because of that dry versus moist kind of environmental setup? Absolutely. I think convective winds are going to be our most substantial threat here alongside frequent cloud to ground lightning strikes. So definitely prepare and kind of keep a radar image close to you guys if you can. Be on the lookout for your National Weather Service local advisories and warnings for your neighborhood just so you can stay ahead of this situation as it begins to unfold because it's getting really close to closing time. Again, we are only about 36 to 48 hours away from when everything is likely to take shape. Alrighty, and that'll wrap up this segment of Weather Center Nazario, guys. Thank you for taking some time out of your Tuesday once more to join me for this abbreviated segment. I really wanted to cover this imminent threat for severe once again for the same general area that will likely not only continue to see it, but has already witnessed it a few different times as we've rolled through summer into fall and now as we approach the winter season. Tomorrow, you definitely don't want to miss our next post-tropics topic. It will actually be a little bit more tropical related because we are going to be kind of doing a little bit of hypothesizing of exactly what 2024 could look like as a way to sort of wrap up the 2023 season within the next two days. Once again, folks, I would genuinely appreciate all the support that we could get for the Weather Center. We are preparing to do some evolution here on the channel so I can present to you guys a bit more of a professional format for my video coverage as we go through the winter and the spring and prepare for our next hurricane season across the North Atlantic. So please hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications if you haven't done so already. I don't want you to miss out on a future update, especially concerning any severe winter storms or any kind of active thunderstorm activity that we're looking at across the South with this El Nino pattern that's going to remain in place at least until April. April, if not May of next year. Alrighty, folks, but once again, thank you very much for your time. We'll see you next time. This is Weather Center Nazario, signing out.